It's, yeah, it's incredible. Camera. It really is incredible. That's Alan Fun's candid camera for those people at home. Wow. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. A crazy lifespan. So that was what, 50 years, 60 plus? That years was ago. in the early, early mid 60s, I guess, right? Uh, uh, he's wow. born in 1947. I mean, so he's like a junior or senior in high school on that one in New Jersey. <laughs> Dude, that is insane. <laughs> that whole look is insane. Wow. Mandel Labor. Wow, that's the only thing he could have. I, I mean, I'll just say this: he never worked a day in his life. He never did a day of manual labor in his life. I guarantee you. His father was a uh, what do you call it when you're a caterer of big events? Um, you know, he does catering, I guess, of, of yeah. events like an event uh, coordinator. You know, no, 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 no. They brought in the food to weddings or whatever. Oh, they did catering, yeah. But it's it's some other kind of caterer, like an event uh, thing with catering. But it's a type of catering, okay. yeah. His mother did like community theater, I think. Uh, but he, he did have this weird sister. He never talked about it. this older sister who was um, in uh, the Unification Church or Scientology. She was in a cult. She might have been in both of them. Um, but he never discussed any of them. Uh, he had a, a brother, and then he had the sister. Never talked about them. Okay, we're of course talking about Richard Lewis in case people yeah. didn't recognize him. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. yeah. <laughs> um, th this would be Richard Lewis here in the middle uh, with this. That's the late Wayne Kramer. Right. Uh, Wayne Kramer passed away uh, two weeks ago. I, now I'm the only one left, Eric. I mean, it's like uh, Richard's gone and now Wayne's gone. And that's me on the right there. I think it's uh, my birthday here in Hollywood in my apartment on Fuller. Uh, Runyon Canyon here in uh, in Hollywood a number of years ago, uh, but yeah, wow, man, that's such a prescient photo. Um, it's Richard, obviously uh, mugging. Uh, he would mug for any camera. I remember being at Dodger Stadium with him one time with his wife, uh, Joyce Lipinski. The you know uh, Richard's real name is Richard Lipchansky. So when I was with the two of them, I'd go. Uh, Miss Lipinski, Miss Lipchan, Mr. Lipchansky, Lip Lipchansky, Lipinski. It was the two funniest names I've ever heard. She didn't change her name, but he did. She had come from the record business. Uh, Joyce, a doll of a woman. Just the other day, I I, I I texted him saying that your wife should have gotten the Nobel Prize in relationship for putting up with you, Richard. I, I mean, I, I, Sunday night, I texted him because he was on Curb. Wow! For the first time, it was obviously recorded in November, but he was on Curb for the first time this season. And, uh, you know, I texted him afterwards. Great turn. Very funny. Uh, I mean, it was a bit that him and Larry had done where he uh, they're gone golfing. And uh, he said to Larry um, that he's leaving him in his will. Uh, how prescient was that? And then the argument ensues with Larry saying, I don't want to be in your stupid will. <laughs> and they're fighting back and forth you know, about being in the will. It was a classic uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Larry and Richard moment. Um, but Richard and I had the same routine that we did for years. He wanted me to uh, do the eulogy at his funeral. And it was a running gag that we had about me writing the eulogy and presenting it. And now uh, he's passed away, you know, just two days ago. I mean, it's just shocking. But uh, absolutely brilliant, neurotic comic. Uh, from the old school. I mean, just absolutely brilliant. I'm glad that he did get one episode of Curb, though. So, Dude, you know, what a way to go. Season, yeah, I just. What a way to go. I mean, discussing his will. 
you know, and 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 arguing with Larry. I mean, him and Larry had a, you know, the, I think they were born about four days apart, uh, oh, the exact yeah. same age. Went to summer camp together, knew each other from childhood. Uh, they had a blood pact that they made uh, when they were starting out in show business as stand-ups. Um, that if anyone would help anyone who was in need of money, if the other one had the money at some point in their career, they would uh, help them out. Uh, then they had a blood pact on this thing. And when anything but love was canceled with Richard Lewis and uh, um, Jamie Lee Curtis, he called up Larry to invoke the pact. <laughs> and he said, it didn't go into syndication and I really need some money to cover my nut. So Larry goes, of course, we made the pact, Richard. <laughs> he says, no problem. He goes, what do you need? He goes, I need $1.3 million. And he goes, what? He goes, what's that, a problem? You've got Seinfeld money. He goes, I need $1.3 million. So Larry says, all right, let me just talk to my wife. It shouldn't be a problem. Well, his wife puts the kibosh on it. He comes back, tells Richard it's a no-go. Richard doesn't speak to him for 10 years because of that thing until he gets the call to join Curb season one, which I guess was 11 years ago. And he goes for the first year, he does it on scale, you know, SAG minimum. And the second year, he calls me up and he says, I'm going to demand a raise. I go, Richard, don't start trouble. You just got back with him. <laughs> don't start trouble. Have your agent do it. And he goes, no, I got it. Mark, I got to confront him. I can't. So I, I try to talk him out of it. He goes to the set. Two minutes on the set, season one, uh, season two, episode one, or whatever, which one he's in, he gets into a fight with Larry David and storms off. Uh, <laughs> so then it starts up again, the feud. I, 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 you can't make this up. But I mean, Richard, Richard had so many weird comedy things that he did. Like one of the things he did was these phony log lines for TV Guide, where you ever see the TV Guide where it has a movie and mm -hmm. that brief description. Yeah, kind of. yeah, but it's so tiny. It's like TV Guide ease that mm -hmm. only they write in their own lingo, like Variety Magazine writes in Variety lingo. TV Guide had log lines from famous or whatever movie, you know, a description. And they try to keep it as short as possible for space. Richard, over the years, rewrote them and did his own versions of them. And my favorite one, I don't remember the rest, but the one I remember for Streetcar Named Desire, uh, the classic Marlon Brando film, was simply a visitor throws off Stanley's bowling game. And I, I never forgot that. It was one of the great log lines of all time. But I, did, I didn't uh, see Richard until... He played Carnegie Hall, I think, in 1989. This is a um, poster he gave me from the event. Uh, if you, maybe if you zoom in, you can see what he wrote in the corner. It doesn't really matter. It's a personal thing between me and him. But um, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'm zooming. Buddy. Whoa, Hunley with there the zoom. Go. Whoa. Hey, hey, hey. Wow, I don't even remember what it says. If I ever something. If I ever needed a Joe Angus. Oh, Joe Ansis. Yeah, Ansys. Joe Ansis was like, we discussed Joe Ansis in uh, the Rodney Dangerfield episode. He was mm -hmm. Rodney's best friend. He was supposedly the funniest guy in New York who never performed as a stand up. Uh, that's who it is referring to as Joe Ansis there. Right. And it continues You're the guy. You are truly one of the most brilliant, authentic uh, mind, uh, minds, okay, uh, minds I have ever known. Mm. Wow. And I was think what does it say? I have to un undersold out. It says something. What does it say? I have you with a something or other. Oh, I love you like a brother. And oh, yeah. No, we were. I mean, he was really like an older brother to me in a lot of ways. I mean, he he was discovered by David Brenner, of course, uh, in Catch a Rising Star and, and clubs in New York. But, you know, the, the amount of riffing that me and him did, I mean, just legendary. This was this was at Carnegie Hall in New York. It was the first time I ever saw him. I didn't even know him. Came out on stage. It was a, a grand piano out there. And he had um, was a roll of printed paper where he did his all his notes. And the, he would go over to the piano and he would unfurl the roll of paper that went on for miles. And he would use it to reference wherever the hell he was in his riffing. And the paper would just be going onto the floor. It was one long, like, bounty roll of paper. And I remember going into the uh, men's room in Carnegie Hall. This is just a side story to Richard Lewis. In the men's room was Doc Severinsen, the trumpet player and band leader for The Tonight Show. 
And mm -hmm. Doc Severinsen was wearing, like he always did, like some sequined one or two piece suit uh, with diamonds on it and sequins glued onto it, thousands of them. And he was drunk and out of his mind, urinating on a man's leg. Uh, that was the same night. And I always remember telling Richard about that. He gets a, a big crack out of it. The other thing he used to get a crack out of was the fact that my mother was in the Lords of Flatbush, the street gang. And he would always say the movie or the street gang. And I would just go the street gang. We'd crack up laughing. And another one we used to do was a phony bungalow colony where they would get on the uh, PA and they used to announce uh, telephone calls from the city to the people who were there. They'd go, you know, Blanche, it's your husband, uh, Bungalow 12. And you go up to this phone booth and pick up the phone. Uh, but I used to do this takeoff on it that simply said, telephone for Hitler, Hitler, telephone. And he would just start crying. And I could say it anywhere at any time. And he would start cracking up. And he, the guy, let me tell you something. One time he was um, in his kitchen, uh, some beehive had broken on the window on the outside and the bees had flown into his kitchen and were stinging him. And he's dealing, he's trying to call like a beekeeper on the phone or something. <laughs> and the phone rings and it's the legendary Albert Brooks. And he says, I can't talk to you now. I'm getting stung by thousands of bees. So Albert Brooks says, throw a gallon of honey on the roof and meet me at Greenblatt's in 20 minutes. One of the great show business lines of all time. And Eric, uh, we, Eric, we used to uh, have lunch, me and him at Greenblatt's, which is right next to the comedy store on Sunset, a Jewish deli upstairs. And he had all kinds of food disorders and food issues, uh, anorexia, side things that nobody knew about. But wow. he, yeah, yeah, yeah. He would invite me over his house and he'd order a pizza to watch you eat the pizza. No, no, he was like a, a peeping Tom food purveyor of watching other people eat. I mean, it was really creepy what he did. And I, dude, it was just, he had so many food issues. It was so insane. Um, anyway, so I used to go to Dodger Stadium with him. I go to pick him up one night. And of course, like usual, I'm wearing my full Dodger uniform with my jersey, with my own name on the back. And he opens the door and he used to have rosacea. <laughs> so he opened the door and he had cream on his face and a thousand pins in it uh, for like, you know, a Japanese treatment of rosacea on his face, looking like Hellraiser. And uh, he says, let me get these off so I can go to the game with you. Comes out, he's wearing like, what he always wore, completely black shoulder pads, uh, black balloon pants like MC Hammer. And he looks at me, he goes, I can't go to the game with you looking like that. And I go, me, look what you're wearing, you piece of crap. And he gets in the car and there's two of us. Now he's dressed like Batman with his <laughs> black cape and I'm wearing my Dodger uniform. We go to the game and we're sitting there and he can't sit still. He has to go around and get the accolades of the fans. I mean, just oh. because of his own peccadillo. So he says, I want to go up and, and say hello to Vin Scully in the booth, who was a Dodger announcer, legendary Dodger <laughs> announcer. He said, I met him a bunch of times. We're good friends. I go, good luck. He never lets anybody in the booth. That's like his thing. He goes, no, no, he'll let me in the booth. He's gone for half an hour. We're in the third inning of the game. He comes back and he goes, God damn, anti-Semite wouldn't let me in. <laughs> and then... Then he just starts cracking jokes in the section that we're in for nine innings. But, dude, the stories of Richard Lewis could go on forever. But the, I'll tell you this one. I was with him and Joyce one time at the game, and um, they have a kiss cam that goes around where you kiss the girl or guy who's with you as a couple. They're able, mm -hmm. to, they're able to look at the stadium beforehand, the inning before, and see who are couples. So they see Joyce and, and, and Richard, his, his wife. And the kiss cam focuses on them and she like puckers up to get kissed. But he, because the camera's on him and he sees himself on Jumbotron, starts mugging for the camera. Well, 52,000 Dodger fans started booing him. I've never seen that in my life <laughs> other than other than for Barry Bonds from the Giants. And his wife turns around to me and she says, Mark, what is wrong with him? And I just started <laughs> cracking up. I mean, just I mean, the stories of of, uh, of the two of them. But. He he told some of these. I don't even know if they're jokes or not. His, his he gets in the car with his parents as a kid to go to San Francisco from New Jersey, and uh, they're sitting in the front seat in the station wagon, about to drive across the country. And his father goes, "What's that goddamn jangling?" And his mother has got uh, something in her hand. She goes, "I have the toll ready for the Golden Gate Bridge, honey." And I mean, just absolutely hysterical jokes. But uh, 
My favorite one, he was in group therapy for so long and he'd go on the road and the group therapy would continue. And he had the therapist put him on the phone and he'd have the phone on the coffee table while the group therapy was going on while he was on the road, Eric. Right. Wow. And one girl in the group therapy was crying. And Richard said, can you cry closer to the phone? I can't hear you. Jesus. Well, and uh, thank you, you two, by the way. We got demonetized in 18 minutes right while on. you're telling a memorial about so, a world-famous comedian. Yes, thank you, you two. Thank you. Bravo.